So for finding good research, really the same principles apply as the research you found for projects like your dissertation. We want to look for peer-reviewed research journals uh, to ensure that, again, um, any of the methodology, the claims, and so on that are made in these uh, research articles are evaluated by peers with knowledge in the field uh, and knowledge with those methods. So um, again, we can do our search uh, through Google Scholar, like you've done in the past, or through um, our CalU website, uh, the library website, uh, using like EBSCOhost. EBSCOhost will probably, however, find most of your articles, not through Medline, which is, again, where we find most of our, uh, again, kind of uh, biological science, medicine, uh, those types of things, but through ERIC. Um, which is a different uh, database but has a lot of educational database however if you're looking at you know again best educational techniques to use on athletic trainers or personal trainers you still may find those articles in medline because they are found in some of those journals related to education for uh, medicine and so on like any search through the library or through um, uh, Google Scholar, you have to know the correct search terms and combination of search terms to get the results that are most efficient. But then um, once I find some really good articles that are kind of right up uh, my alley in terms of my topic and my population, I find often my best source for uh, other articles is to check the citations from those articles. So again, I really like to look at their reference list and see what articles they've cited because often uh, they may have used some different search terms or look for slightly different things and again they may find some really good articles as well but the goal is to find several articles that are you know really looking at your population your te your technology that you're questioning about and your technique and then uh, see what their findings are um, <clears throat> when you're looking at these articles you'll again find some that are very relevant some are you know, maybe tangentially relevant. Maybe they're using the technique that you want, but instead of studying college age students, they're studying, uh, you know, uh, middle school students or elementary. You know, you have to take those results with a grain of salt. But I always look for, again, uh, the articles and their relevance. Um, if we see some benefit to a different population, uh, it might we may see a similar benefit in the population I work with. But really, I'm looking for the most relevant articles. So I look at things like, you know, who was the target audience? Was the technique that they used, was it exactly the same as what I want to do? Or was it using a slightly different technology? You know, often I'll see, for instance, studies that look at learning management systems, uh, that the study was done utilizing Blackboard. And well, you know, while we don't have Blackboard, we have Desire to Learn or Brightspace. Um, therefore, I have to look, does Brightspace do the same thing that Blackboard does and so on. So you have to look at the technique and then, again, look at the type of education. Is this a formal education setting, which is where I often apply my knowledge because I teach in a formal educational class. However, if you're teaching in an informal environment, like teaching your clients about different things, you may want to look for studies that are again, working in that informal type of an educational setting because the students that are in those situations are come with very different motivations and need maybe different learning tools uh, to learn the most from them. You know, you're not going to get someone who just wants to learn a little bit about nutrition to sit down and read an entire textbook. So we have to maybe feed them the information in a easier to digest way. Uh, that's a really bad analogy or pun, but sorry about that. Um, but again, that that's, we may have to look at things a little bit differently depending upon our population and the setting. Um, anytime you read any our research article and are going to utilize it, you do want to make sure that it's rigorous, that they've really questioned the different things and clearly identified their objective measures. What, like what were their measures of success? Um, and again, are, the, are you looking for similar measures or similar outcomes? All good studies also have enough detail so that you can rep you could replicate the study. And obviously, we want to focus primarily um, uh, on peer-reviewed research, assuming that that's that's out there. 
Uh, when when it comes to um, evidence-based practice, there are a number of designs that can be utilized. By far, and this is whether you're talking about medicine or education, by far the best type of study uh, in terms of quality in, uh, in comparing a couple different techniques or uh, treatments or medications or whatever they may be are randomized controlled trials where they take a big group of people and they randomly assign them to the different treatment groups. Um, often though in education we can't do that. You know, I can't take all of my students and say, hey, I'm going to give iPads to some of you and to others I'm not and then grade them because uh, they're going to get mad. They're going to, some of the kids, they're going to say, well, I didn't do well because you didn't give me an iPad or whatever it may be. So often we can't do randomized controlled uh, trials in all situations. Therefore, you often will see case control studies or cross-sectional studies. Um, again, not as strong statistically as a randomized controlled st uh, study, but uh, again, still a valid uh, way to examine different technologies. For instance, um, what we did in one study, we had a grant uh, looking at the use of iPads in a um, online, sorry, on a live anatomy class. And we used them in one section of the course, but not in the other section of the course. Uh, one section was taught by me. One section was taught by a different professor. We did share a lot of our PowerPoints and our presentations and so on. But uh, when we looked at six, you know, improvements over the period of time, while iPads were certainly one thing that was different between the groups. The other difference was the instructor. So we don't know for sure were the improvements just due to the iPad or was it also the instructor or some combination of the two. And then kind of again remember the the lowest level of research or again uh, published uh, 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 information or expert opinion that's still above like again blogs and so on but expert opinion is not as strong of a study design and you should not put as much faith into a uh, an expert opinion as you do randomized controlled trials so even if I go to a conference and I hear someone speak about uh, again um, some technique that they've used and they are seen as kind of an expert on that I still do want to go and look into the literature and see if there's uh, studies to back up those claims when it comes to measures of effectiveness, um, again, we can look at a number of different types of, of, of measures. Again, we come to, uh, when we create this content, we do it with different goals in mind. Obviously, uh, you know, student learning is the most important thing, but there's different aspects of that learning. We may want to see student achievement at the end of the course, or we want to see, may want to see uh, their student achievement at the end of a program. So again, if I've given them a good basis of anatomy, that should not just help them when it comes to the anatomy final, it should help them when we get to the end of the program, because if they know the basics better, then they can learn the advanced topics better. So we may look at student achievement. We may look at things like student satisfaction. Were they happy or happier with a certain technique over another technique? If they're more satisfied, they may be more engaged. We may measure demonst or, or, or have students demonstrate competency in a certain skill, a lab skill, or the ability to do a certain uh, 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 teach a certain training technique or do a special test that evaluates the ACL of the knee and so on. So again, we may want them to demonstrate competency. We may want them to improve a skill, a hands-on skill or an analytical skill. We may want to measure, uh, again, their ability or how engaged they were in their class. You know, how uh, excited were they about coming to class? How excited were they about, you know, doing the course assignments, uh, doing the course, uh, looking at the course media, and so on. So we may want to look at engagement. And then you'll see some studies look at, again, uh, after a person graduates, they, they ask them, and they're out in the workplace, they'll ask them, again, how useful was this course to your ability to do this job? And, and again, so we can measure effectiveness of, in terms of uh, uh, educational technology and instructional technology in a lot of different ways. And you have to think about, again, what are you trying to get out of your students? And then that's, that's the type of research that you may be looking for. So again, once you find these articles, I always, uh, again, like I said, there's such a proliferation of research, research just, it's hard to keep up with 
uh, all the stuff that's out there. And I've kind of given you some of my philosophies of how to read articles uh, in the previous presentation. But again, I, I try to keep up with, again, a couple different groups, the Educause, their uh, new postings and so on. I also uh, have a couple journals that I kind of follow that are free and online. Uh, now, I don't read the whole journal every month. What I do, though, is I'll read through the table of contents, look at the titles. If the title is of interest to me, I'll then read the abstract. If the abstract is like, eh, this isn't that interesting or it doesn't go in the direction I expected, then I stop there. If the abstract is of interest and I think, hey, I do want to learn a little bit more, then I'll read the introduction of the article because the introduction often has some really good evidence, uh, some good research um, that they cite. They'll cite some of the other studies in that area and the background. They give you the background on that topic. And they often give me some ideas of other articles that I may want to pull or look at and so on. I then, after I read the introduction, I read the conclusion because uh, the conclusion kind of sums up, so what did they find? What was the best thing to do if my goal is to improve discussions or create the best videos for students to watch, etc.? Um, I read the conclusion. And most often I will say I stop there. I do the abstract, the introduction, and the conclusion. I don't necessarily need to know the methods. Um, if I'm just trying to utilize what their conclusions are, I'm going to assume the methods uh, must have been valid, must have been good, um, if they made it into this peer-reviewed journal. However, I do read the methods if I do want to see what different ways they tweak the discussion. If, again, if they're looking at the best way to, to create a discussion for student engagement, I do want to see what the different options were, what the different treatments per se were, and which ones were most effective. So then I may dive into the methods and the discussion to see exactly what they did. And then finally, I uh, once I'm done with the article, hey, did that affect my knowledge in this area? Does this help me answer the question I had about, again, how to best structure a discussion and so on? The um, Some of the articles that I find most useful, again, especially when it's a topic you don't know a whole lot about, a great place to start are reading systematic reviews or meta-analyses. I know you've gone over these before in other classes, but again, a systematic review is a great place to start when you want to get, again, kind of a very broad picture of a topic. Now, there isn't always a systematic review written on every topic, but for instance, again, if you want to learn about, hey, what are the best practices in regards to an online discussion in a course, uh, a systematic review is a great place to start because they'll discuss, you know, what parts of a discussion have people looked at? You know, have they looked at, again, how, how frequently they post, uh, the length of their post, the types of questions to ask, and so on. So it'll summarize a large body of evidence and give you a lot of different uh, kind of ideas of what the important factors are within a discussion that can impact student learning or impact the things that you want to impact. Uh, typically, a systematic review is not a statistical analysis. So again, it's, it's going to summarize the findings of a whole bunch of primary research articles. Again, the, uh, the uh, list of citations or references in a systematic review are a great thing to look at to find some of those primary articles that maybe are going to be really useful to you. But again, I like to start with a systematic review or a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is basically, it's like a systematic review, but what they've actually done in a meta-analysis is they take the data from all of these primary studies glom it all together into one bigger data set and try to answer a particular question. So again, like a systematic review, it encompasses a large range of previously performed research and comes up with some new conclusions based on all of the data that's out there, but it does include a mathematical treatment that the systematic review does not do. However, a meta-analysis often is much more focused and doesn't take as big of a snapshot as a systematic review. But both are great places to start when you want to learn more about a particular educational te uh, technique or uh, instructional uh, technology of some type.